people always seek to find the most stable place and remain. Now, if you try to bring a person from error into truth, there is a, there is a period of destabilization, and that is not very comfortable. And most of the time, it is the reason why most people would not want to move. Or you get them going back to the era, because that is a, that is a stable place. Um, a person will prefer to be on this level than to be taken up here to stay here. Because here, ground zero, they've been comfortable for years. Now you're lifting them up to sit on this uh, platform, which is, it is, it's a plateau. I mean, it is stable. But they're not comfortable with that place. They think they will fall. And that is a picture of what we see in Christianity a lot of times. So the apostles have to really say the same thing over and over and over and over and over so as to get a thing ingrained. So at one time, Paul would say, I do not find it burdensome. It doesn't trouble me to say the same thing over and over again because I know it is for your safety. It is for your security. It will help you. One of the things that I realize that most believers find very troublesome is to put confidence in Christ alone. You might think, you might ask, why, why is this? A, but it, it is, and that's what, that, is what exactly, that, that is exactly what I've tried to explain in few words. Confident, confidence in Christ alone. To some, that is the most difficult thing you can ask them to do in life. Because throughout their Christian life, they've been confident in everything else except Christ. But how did they get saved? Yes, they believe him for salvation, and then, and then that's it. He only saves us. And then the rest is ours. We do it all by ourselves. And so they've been doing this for years. Their confidence, their joy is, is in what they do. So if you not try to remove them, to put them to... Uh, to to, to put them in a place where their confidence will, or trust will be in only Christ. It destabilizes them. And they feel like they are sinning. They feel like they are not really saved properly because their whole body, their emotions, everything is tied to that information that they've had for years. So we really need the grace of the um, the grace of the Spirit to really help us in this area when a person has for a long time depended upon himself or certain things uh, to keep himself going. For, for some people, not until they have um, they have gone on a mountain somewhere to pray for 28 days in, in three months, they feel like, no, they are not really living the Christian life. Uh, something is not happening right. Because they've attached their stability and everything to them going to those places. So the aspect of Christ keeping them, they know it, but really it's not being lived. Because in the faith, knowing is not intellectual. <laughs> knowing is more than that. It shows up in your practice. If your practice doesn't reveal what you say you know, it's only intellectual. A person doesn't really know it. Uh, this brings me to... Um, Philippians chapter, chapter 3, and I want us to look at something, chapter 3, very quickly.
Okay. It, it says in chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write this, the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. We need to remember that in the latter part of chapter 2, he has encouraged them to be joyful. Especially twenty-seven to twenty-nine of chapter two, he says, For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. So he is continually tell, continuously telling them to be joyful. Um, sending Epaphroditus back onto, 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 onto them. And he, Paul, is glad, excited, rejoicing that their minister is well because he was almost sick unto death and he would have had sorrow upon sorrow. I'm sending back to you, rejoice. And then in verse, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Oh, sorry, rejoice in the, in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So, so basically he is asking them to be joyful in their union in the Lord. Be joyful in the Lord. So in your union with Christ, be joyful. Be glad. If I should put in, in in our modern day, be excited for, 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 your, for being in the Lord, for your union with Christ. Be joyful. And he continues by saying that for me, it is not a bother to me to tell you this again because I know that the end result is your safety. So I want to say that being uh, um, other things may be other things may be in view when he says um, to say the same things to you is not grievous. But the issue of joy is key here, and I, I don't want us to uh, look look away from it because in twenty seven, which we've just read, he said. I would have had sorrow upon sorrow. If Epaphroditus had died, I would have had sorrow upon sorrow. Meaning, there's already reason to sorrow. And his would add to it. To God be the glory. To be joyful is, is an encouragement needed in the body of Christ today so much. Because there's so many things that come our way that would want to make us sorrowful, not have any joy, go with long phases. And if we are not joyful in the law, in our if we are not joyful of our, our union in the Lord, we will be removed from it. But one thing that is so needed today is our mindfulness of our union with Christ. And to be able to focus on Christ. Because he is the main thing. 
Remove Christ from Christianity and there is nothing left for us. Nothing left for us. Absolutely nothing. So to be joyful in the Lord is very, very necessary. Let me put it this way. People are easily removed from the joy of being in Christ. People are easily removed. Easily. Because it is the characteristics of people generally is after we have been in a place for some time, we get used to that place and we begin to stretch our necks elsewhere to look in the, in the other garden. And we say it is beautiful out there. It is wonderful out there. Because we take it where we are for granted. It is only when you are removed from there, then you begin to see that there was a place to cherish. And being in Christ is what God planned for us even before the creation. So that is the most stable place we could ever be. And our fulfillment, our joy and everything is in there. And we need to encourage one another to be joyful in our union with the Lord, I believe, every day. Because, Like Paul said, to remind you of the same things for me is not burdensome. Because I know it is for your safety. Because humans as we are, we are soon removed from our places of safety because being who we are we, all, we normally take things for granted uh, we, we forget most people do not or most Christians let me put it this way do not go through their Christian life thinking of John 3.16. Which I'll read here. Which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting love. This is love portrayed in this text. Um, many people have recited, have rehearsed this, recited this text over and over and over and over and over, and they seem to think that the milk has gone out of it. But there is still meat in it. Because the Bible says that the word of the living God is ever fresh. Hallelujah. See, the grass withereth and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord abides forever. Its power does not waste away with time. Our joy, our safety is in remaining in Christ. Our joy and our safety lies in our, in our ability to stay, in our staying in Christ and focusing on him and him alone. The moment we begin to move here and there, we destabilize 
ourselves. I know that for the person who has not been rejoicing in Christ, in what he has done, to tell him to focus on Christ is really destabilizing. But I believe that as we keep on, as we keep on hammering this, this truth, stability will, will come. Hallelujah. The truth of the matter is what Paul says here. Unless we are joyful in Christ, in our union with him, we will begin to seek other foundations. But there is no other foundation anyone can lay except that which is in, which is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. See what Paul is saying here. He's behind bars, but he's saying they are to rejoice. Epaphroditus almost died, but they are to rejoice in Christ. His life hangs in the balance. He may be killed or not killed. I mean, whatever, it's 50-50. But he still says, rejoice in the Lord. So, the circumstance should not determine Rejoicing in, in the Lord, in our union. Which means whatever happens, we are to rejoice in Him. Because our stability depends on it. Circumstances, we cannot tell whether they will always remain the, the same. But we can rejoice in the Lord. But we are to rejoice in the Lord. He is stable. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says, it says it very, very nicely. It says that neither sorrow. See, this, this day, for this day is a holy day unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorrowful, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word strength, the word translated strength there is also tra translated Fortified place. Fortified place. So the joy of the Lord, or the joy of the Lord, is your fortified place. So if you leave the joy of the Lord, or being in the Lord, you leave your fortified place. So we are to rejoice in our union with the Lord, he says here. So remaining in, or being in Christ should be our chief joy. What is it in Christ? What is it? What is it that we can be joyful? The fact that Christ is in the form of God. He's in the form of God. Therefore, we are safe in him. There's safety. Rejoice in our union with him. I must confess, when it hit me, when it, when it did hit me that Christ is God, I became very bold in talking about the truth, in, in talking about the scriptures. I became very, very bold. That Christ said it. This is what Christ has done for us. Because I come to realize that he is God. So basically, it is God who has commanded me to do what I am doing. It is God himself who has died for me. He is God. It may, not, it may not mean anything to you, but it means so much to me. That Christ is God. He's not a mere man. He is God. He's fully man, fully God. And I became so bold in speaking the truth. And many people interpreted it as pride. Hallelujah. In our union with Christ, in the fact that he died on the cross for us, that means 
in him, we have our forgiveness. We can trust in him completely. And the Bible says that he ever lives to make intercession for us. We are to rejoice in this, that he ever lives to make intercession for us. So we will always have favor. There's someone. There's someone. There's someone always speaking on our behalf. Making intercession for, on our behalf. So we know we are covered. Before him who matters. Before him who decides what happens in the earth. We have someone there speaking for us on our behalf. So as we go about doing things here, and sometimes people want to believe that they are disfavored and the heavens are closed upon them. I don't believe the heavens are closed upon me. I believe that the heavens are open upon me. Because I am in Christ. And he had the heavens open upon him. And I am in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that when Jacob slept in that place, he saw a ladder. A ladder linking from him to heaven. There is a ladder bridging the gap between me and God. He's, Christ. He's called Christ. So I don't think that the heaven, I have brass heavens upon my head. Because I am in Christ Jesus. We have to rejoice in these so that no one come with anything to discourage our hearts. That you know your prayers are not going nowhere because it's closed upon you. No, it, for me it is open. I don't believe that it is closed. I believe it is open. Because there's someone who connects heaven to earth. His name is Jesus. And I've got the hold of him. Or, or he's got the hold of me. And will never let me go. Hallelujah. Amen. And it, it is not me who will not let him go. It is he who will not let me go. That's why I, I, I reverse the, the, the words in that song when I, when I sing it. Jesus, lover of my soul. And then they say, I will never let you go. I'm not that strong to keep him. <laughs> Jacob thought he could do it. But the divine one dis uh, touched, his, touched him and dislocated his limb. <laughs> Which means Jacob was helpless, couldn't do nothing. It is he who said he would never leave me nor forsake me. And we are to rejoice in this, in our union with him. Hallelujah. Again, he is the glorious one who is soon coming for us to take the glorious king who is coming to take those who believe in him. And we know that his coming is soon. That's what he says. And we rejoice in this. So we do not sorrow in him. There's more than enough to rejoice in Christ. To be comfortable in Christ. Some people are of the view that to rejoice in our union with, with Christ when there are problems is not reality. For some people, to rejoice in our union with, with Christ when there are problems, it's not real. I mean, you're not being real to yourself. There's, there, there's a problem, and you are rejoicing in your union with Christ. But the thing is, do you want to live by facts, or do you want to live by faith? I choose to live by faith, because faith is reality. Hello. God is reality. So if I put confidence in God, I put confidence in reality. Now, in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, my Bible tells me that 
For the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So the things which I'm seeing right now are just temporal things. But God is eternal. He is reality. Faith is reality. Because that is the realm of God. It was in the midst of all this that he tells the church, rejoice in the Lord. Because the things happen around you, you cannot rejoice in them, but you can rejoice in the Lord. Praise God. Basically, if we think that we can stand on our own when the issues in life are bombarding us from left and right, we are kidding. The only way we can stand is to be joyful in our union in, in Christ and what is done, what is available to us, to be joyful in these things, to be joyful in these things. For this is reality. Hello. For this is reality, to be joyful. If joy is taken away from the believer, there's nothing left. Joy, joy in the Lord. If it's taken away, there's nothing left. Our stability lies in it. Joy in the Lord is our fortified place. It's our stronghold. It's our refuge. We run into that. We are saved. Amen. Things can be happening around us. But if we can run into the joy of the law, I mean, be joyful in Christ, in what he's done for us. We take our eyes off. Because if we, if we are able to take our eyes off these things and focus on him, we will soon be removed. Focus must be on him. And we must... Have joy in the Lord. I told some people, I said, deliberately begin to rejoice in the things that Christ has done for you. Rejoice in them. Because for a long time you've not practiced this. Become joyful. Be, develop in, think about it. Meditate, meditate, meditate upon them. And become joyful in them. Deliberately. For whatever you focus on, gets magnified. Focus on Christ and he gets magnified. He gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Focus on anything else and they get bigger and bigger. And you think God is not able. But as you focus upon God, he gets bigger and bigger <coughs> and bigger. Hallelujah. So the, the, the first thing he highlights is the fact that they are to be joyful in the Lord. Now, the, Apo the Apostle Paul is going somewhere. And he begins with this, be joyful in the, in the Lord. Verse 2. In verse 2, he says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil, work evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So when he says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of, of the concision or the mutilators. And then he says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in, in, the, in, the, in the spirit, clearly we know who, is, who he's referring to. He is referring to the Jewish teachers who are going about teaching that a person must be, a person who is born again, or a Gentile must be circumcised or else he's not fully accepted by God. So we know, we know who, who he's talking about. Now, why does, he, why does he refer to them as dogs? The, 
the term dox was, was used both by Jews and Gentiles. I mean, they both use the term dog. But when the term dog is used, it is used to describe those who are shameless. It also refers to those who have no part in the kingdom of God. They're unholy and profane. If we look at Matthew 7 verse 6, it says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. In practice, in the olden days, if you sell a dog, you better not bring the price of that dog in the, as your donation in the, in the temple. Unacceptable. Deuteronomy 20, 23 verse 18 says, Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For both of these are abomination unto the Lord. So basically, to call them dogs, what the Apostle Paul is here is saying is that these people are unqualified to even be in the house of the Lord in the first place and to, to, to teach the disciples of Christ. So they are unqualified to be your teachers. Unqualified not in terms of, not in human terms, but before God. They are unqualified to be your teachers. Because dogs... Dogs are those who are unholy, profane, not required to stand before the house of the living God, let alone to teach God's people. So you refer to them as dogs. And then the, the mutilators, all the concision, all, the, all the, the circumcision, they are the people who in Acts 15, Acts 15, if you read Acts 15 verse 1, they are the same people that Paul is referring to here. He's like, And certain men which came down from Judea taught brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the man of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Hello. So this person, these are saying that Except you are circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. What we need to understand is that for any man to have a true work with God, he must be circumcised. That's, that's truth. So Paul is not saying circumcision is unimportant. He's, he, 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 he's not saying that circumcision it's important. But it is a manner of circumcision he's dealing with here. Okay. Romans 8.23. <laughs> circumcision is important, but it depends on where it takes place. It is important, but where it takes place is an issue. So Paul is not saying, he, he never says circumcision was not important, but he's, it was the manner and where it takes place. Okay, Romans 2.28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit and not in the latter whose praise is not of men but of God. So there is a circumcision which is needful and is a circumcision of the heart. Hallelujah. So back in Philippians he says we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. So these people praise God. So these people are focusing on, on outward circumcision.
And uh, Paul calls them dogs because probably they are profane. They are just in interested in seeing. Um, <coughs> they get interested in seeing people. Paul said, it is. It is not needed. The circumcision that is needed is, is the circumcision of the heart. Praise be to God. And he says, he says, he calls them deceitful workers. Deceitful workers. They are deceitful workers because they are not true ministers of the gospel. Because they are putting emphasis where emphasis need not be. They put emphasis on outward circumcision. Whilst it's supposed to be inward circumcision done by the Spirit. When you, um, because evil workers or deceitful workers, they appear as if they are gospel ministers. But you can know who they are because they put emphasis on everything else except Christ. But the emphasis must be on Christ and Christ alone. Praise God. Again, in Deuteronomy and in Jeremiah, we see that although when, when the, uh, God asks them to do the outward circumcision, his emphasis was always on heart circumcision. Praise God. So what we see here is um, Deuteronomy 10 verse 16 says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be not stiff-necked. Circumcise the foreskin of your heart. In Deuteronomy 30 verse 6, it says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thine seed, the heart of your seed. So circumcision, the whole, the actual work is that of the heart. Praise God. And then in Jeremiah 4.4, 4, it says, Circumcise yourselves to the, to, to the Lord, and take away the foreskin of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. So we see clearly, clearly, that although they, they were asked to do the outward circumcision, their main thing was that what God was requiring from them was that they would walk in obedience, love, and have compassion for one another. But that was not there. They were just circumcising the outward flesh, and that, and that was it. And that's what many people still do today. They just go through the outward rituals, but really, real worship to God is not there. Because sometimes people can do all the outward things, and that gives a, sh that, that gives a show of worship to God. But the heart is not touched. What God wants is not coming. Like Christ said, he said uh, Christ quoted, he said, Indeed, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are removed from me. So what Paul is saying is that, don't fall for that. For they are only trying to get you to give outward worship. But you are the circumcision which worship God in spirit. Amen. You are the circumcision which worship God in spirit. Is it Philippians 3 verse 3? For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So don't let them take you back to have confidence in the outward things. Because that's what they, they were, they, the mutilators are trying to do. They are trying to let you have confidence in the outward. 
Hallelujah. And says we have, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. That is basically we do not place any emphasis on our birth, how we're born, and all. The, we, we don't have any, we don't place any emphasis on those things as far as serving God is concerned. Whether we are the seed of Abraham or we are the seed of whoever who is nameless, in Christ Jesus, we are the circumcision. And not those who through Abraham have been circumcised outwardly to God be the glory hallelujah now he says we do not worship we have no confidence in the flesh now we know that the word flesh means different things in different contexts but here the flesh talks re refers to physical advantages which we have which cause us not to submit to the will of God Physical advantages, which makes us not to submit to the will of God. So, anything, um, anything that causes us to deny the place of Christ or Christ his place. Because some people think that they can manifest certain things. Uh, manifest the gift of God or anything if they do certain things. Um, exercises but really if you happen to go through that and something comes to you what you need to understand is that it is by the grace of God it's been dealt to you through Christ Jesus not because of your physical uh, gymnastics or whatever you've done the emphasis should, be, should still be placed on Christ. Because some do testify, oh yeah, I prayed all the night and then I had this. I, had, I fasted and I, and I had this. So there's power in fasting. No, there is power in the word of God and in Christ Jesus. Not in these things. I prayed six hours every day and that was when I had this thing. You know what happened? When you were praying, something happened to, to you. You began to, to desire God as you should have a long time ago. So whatever thing happened, happened. So the emphasis should not be placed on that. The emphasis should be placed in Christ. Because it is in Him you've been accepted in the first place to even stand before God. Because without Christ... You have no standing before God. So I, it's, it's my heart desire that believers grasp this. That the emphasis is not placed on those things. Because many Christians place the emphasis on everything else apart from Christ. So their confidence is not in the person of Christ. Not in the finished work. I would say most of the problems that we have in the church is because people do not really understand the nature of God very well. Some also do not appreciate the, the work of Christ and do not know the ministry of the Holy Spirit. When these things are not there, then people, there are so many issues happening in the church of God. But when people come to a good, a good under, understanding of what Christ has done, it will eliminate most of the things that we see around us. When we do not de depend upon Christ alone to approach God and begin to invent our own things, we have denied him. We have basically denied him. So, no, I haven't denied Christ. No, no, you have. You have denied him his place. No one can come to the Father except through me. You say you can do it without him. You put the emphasis on something else, but not on him. God have mercy. Hallelujah. So basically, the mind of the flesh denies, it denies the fact that flesh or the self 
is incapable. Is incapable of having salvation by itself. It denies the mind of the, it denies that. But the mind that is submitted to the Lord says that hey, I understand man is totally de depraved. And I need Christ to get to God. Hallelujah. You may say, Oh, but we are believers, we don't we don't need this, you know. I would like to say to you that even among born again believers, these things still reign. Now and then, our minds some, sometimes want to tell us that, you know, it is what we have done that has brought us this. But we always need to be reminded that, no, it is Christ. It is Christ. We need to constantly be reminded. I did this and this thing came. I did that and this thing came. I did that and that, and that came. We need to be reminded that it came because of Christ. Hallelujah. Are we not to pray? Oh, yeah, we have to pray. Are we not to study our Bibles? Oh, we have to study our Bibles, yes. Praise God. But it is because of Christ that what we have come to us. Hallelujah. As sons of God, we want to know the will of God. Read his word. If you love someone, you fellowship. And prayer, as best as I know it, is fellowship with the Lord. You want to fellowship. Whatever comes out, it comes as a result of, of Christ. Praise God. So we approach him based on what he's done for us. Hallelujah. Romans 7 verse 6. Hallelujah. He says, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. And have no confidence in the flesh. We've explained that. That we have no confidence. We, we, we don't put any, any confidence in the, in the. Because sometimes people want to say, you know, when I was born, uh, there was a, I came with a Bible in my, in my hand. Or when I was born, there was such and such and such and such and such about me. So that is what makes me. That's. That's what qualifies me to stand up before God. No, it is Christ. Hallelujah. Or when I was growing up, second, 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 happened. No, it is Christ. At the end of the day, it boils down to Christ Jesus. Amen. It is Christ. When I was born, in my, in my palm, there was a cross indicating that Christ died for me. That's the reason. I mean, fine, I'm glad he died for you but the truth of the matter is that there's there's nothing nothing to do with our birth that qualifies us to stand up before christ not with our education not with our achievement nothing that qualifies us to stand up before god what what, what qualifies us to stand before god is christ's death and resurrection hallelujah what is done for us that's what qualifies us to stand before god and nothing else. To God be the glory. And then come to this point. See, and we are those who worship God in the spirit. Worship God in the spirit. We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. What does that mean? That we worship God. With the spirit. I want to put it this way. That. In the context of what he's discussing. He's, he's discussing. Not approaching God. Not having confidence in God. Based upon anything else but Christ. Now the natural man. 
the man unregenerated thinks that he can reach God by his own efforts, by his own inventions, by his own goodness. Um, I stand before God qualified because I pay such and such an, um, an amount to, to an orphanage. I build a, build, I, I build a house for the, for the church. Um, I am good. I'm, I'm a good person. I mean, we, we try to reach God by our own effort. That is what the unregenerated man does. But when we become regenerated, we no longer approach God in that manner. We approach God on the basis of what Christ has done for us. And that is because we are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit has circumcised our hearts. The heart of stone has been taken away. Our heart has been circumcised. So now we have been renewed in our, in our, in our, in our, in our minds. And we know that the way to God is Christ. Hallelujah. That is basically what he's saying here. So we, we, we worship God under the influence of the Spirit. In that we approach God the way God has laid down that he wants to be approached. Hebrew says, he says, you have taken away the old that you may establish the second. So now the way to God is through Christ. And uh, so that's because that, that, that is the context he is, he is speaking here. That's the context. That it is not dependent upon anything. Because I've, I've heard people, so what does it mean to worship God in the spirit? Does it mean to, to ask the Holy Spirit, what should I do and all that? It, basic, the context which you use here, it is basically that you are now under the influence, you, 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 you've now come under the jurisdiction or the influence of the Holy Spirit where you no longer serve God according to your own, inven your own invention, but now according to the way that God has described as through Christ, I am the way, the, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That is the point, the emphasizing here, that it is Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. So in Romans 7 verse 6, when he says, but now we are delivered from the law. This is the same Paul speaking here. That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of the spirit. That we should serve in the newness of the spirit. There has been a newness in the inner man. The old is gone. That is what he's referring to. We are the circumcision which served God in the spirit, referring to what the Holy Ghost has done. The new, we now serve God after the new nature. We now serve, worship God after the new man. We do not give God dead worship after the old man, where it was in forms and traditions and all kinds of. Now we worship God after the new man. Praise God. So when a person is um, when a person is Christ focused, he gives God spirit worship. He's worshiping God in the spirit. In that, uh, according to the Philippians 3 3 sense. Hallelujah. When a person is, is when a person is regenerated and the person is submitted to Christ and, and the person is Christ focused. His worship is in the spirit. Christ said, the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Holy Spirit will regenerate people. They will no longer go through certain rituals and all that, but they will be worshiping God through me. They will be coming to God through me. They will be relating to God through me. Everything shall be dependent, shall be through me. 
they will not lay emphasis on anything else. They will not put confidence in anything else. Because all along, throughout history, emphasis has been placed on every other thing else. I mean, there's that, there's that. But now, God has taken, put away, God has put aside all these things. And he has presented us one man and one person. Jesus Christ. Him and him alone. It is him alone. Confidence in anything else is not the spirit worship that Paul talks about here. Hallelujah. Praise God. A heart that is willing to go the way of God or do things God's way, a mind or heart that is willing to serve God in the new tabernacle, it's one that is worshiping God in the spirit. Because now a new tabernacle has been created. Hebrews 8 verse 2. Said that Christ now serves in the, in the new tabernacle. Praise God. So the old tabernacle is over. We no longer serve God in, for, in, in those old forms. With our F, uh, our efforts, our um, dignities, and with our, all, our, all, the, all the things that we do, it is now not required. Because if it is required, I'm sure most of us will not make it. So God in his wisdom has removed all those things. And that shows how good God is and how gracious God is because he has presented us one man, Christ Jesus, that through him we can all be accepted. Hallelujah. Because if we leave Christ out of the equation, some of us will not make the cut. Hello? So, the circumcision which worship God in spirit refers to those who serve God based entirely upon the finished work of Christ. And understand that that the understand that man is depraved and look to Christ alone for salvation and have no confidence in themselves. Praise the Lord. When I say confidence in themselves in this sense, I don't mean confidence as in the sense that you can't even when you stand before people you are shaking. But confidence in the sense that you do not think that. It is by virtue of who you are that God hears you. But by virtue of the fact that you are in Christ, that's why he hears you. Hallelujah. I mean, I know many, but we know these things. But now and then, we tend to, tend to forget it. So we need to be reminded. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, there is something that Paul picks here, which I want to quickly look at, and then I'll bring this thing to a close. Verse 4. Verse 4. So he dealt with the circumcision. And then in verse 4, he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man think it, that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Those I counted loss for Christ. So here, Paul wipes out any, philosophy, uh, any, philo any philosophical arguments that might say that he, Paul is using the, the straw man. He, 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 he's trying to run down the arguments of the, of, the, of, the, of the opponents. So here he says, I'm also a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Pharisee. I mean, I was trained as a Pharisee. 
concerning zeal are persecuted the church. So not that it's because I don't have these things that I'm trying to run it down. But what I'm telling you is that as far as the righteousness of God, attain the righteousness of God is concerned, these things are done. These things have no place. They have no, absolutely no place. I counted them all loss so that I may gain Christ. But there's an, a person cannot have Christ whilst he still has confidence in all these physicals, all these qualifications. Hallelujah. So what Paul does here is exactly what Christ said a person needs to do. You know, in the parable in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus Christ gave a parable. said, when a person finds a field of great price, he will sell whatever he has so he may gain it. And that's exactly what Paul does here. I, I count everything that I have, I put, it, I put it behind me that I may gain Christ. So I have, I have no confidence. So I don't come to God based on confidence in anything. My confidence is in Christ. My hope is built on nothing less. On Christ's solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Hallelujah. So self-importance and everything I trade off. Educational pride and worldly fame, I trade them all off. Nothing counts here. Some people think, some people I feel with so much self-important that, that they think that is what gets them something before God. It is Christ. It is Christ and Christ alone. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. And then it says, verse 8 says, Yes, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things, and do count them as dung, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto him, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. So here, it says that sometimes people feel confident that they are believers because of what they do. I read 10 chapters of the Bible every day. And that's what makes them feel confident that they are believers. That is good. Read. But your confidence should not be in the fact that you read 10 chapters of the Bible. A confidence should be in the fact that you know Christ. Christ lives inside you. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. He has saved you. So our confidence should not be upon anything that we do. But in Christ. And then here, what he says, he said, that I may know him. That I may know him and become conformable unto him. Now, doesn't Paul already know him? Isn't he a believer? Isn't he born again? He's talking about and knowing that is just beyond intellectual knowledge. Hello. Because, you know, you can have intellectual knowledge of the scriptures but not know him. There's something we call tacit knowledge. I believe that is what he's referring here. 
you can't transfer it by writing on paper. It comes through contact and trust. You see, he says that I may know him. Let me just summarize. Let, let me just wrap up here. He, 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 he says that I may know him. Paul is so focused on Christ. He says, I rejoice in him. I put no confidence in the flesh. I also want to know him to the extent that and to, and to the extent uh, and the power of his, of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformable unto him even unto death that I may attain, uh, I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, watch something here. He, he, he wants to know him in such an intimate way, right? In such an intimate way, um, to the extent that he will be able to even endure suffering with with Christ. The kind of knowledge he's talking, knowing Christ that he's talk, talking about, is not um, that idea of uh, being born again or having the knowledge. He all the all these things he has, but he's talking about. Getting to know Christ intimately. And knowledge which I don't think we will even exhaust knowing him because he's vast. Praise God. But yet still we got to know him. Um, this man, um, George Muller, it was after George Muller had had so m- many uh, miraculous answer, answer, answers to prayers. He said, I can say I know the Lord. Because to have miraculous answers to prayers means that you were in critical con. I mean, you have, you have faced tough times, challenging moments, and you've, you've seen God come through as you trusted him. So he said, and now I can say, I know the Lord. Most of the time, it's only after you have had some challenging experiences, difficult ones, gone through trying moments, and you stay there trusting Lord, trusting the Lord, and He reveals Himself in a, in a certain way to, to you, and you can say, "I know the Lord. I know that I have come to understand God in a way I didn't know bef- before." It's always like that. A young lady, a young missionary, I mean, a, a young lady ma- missionary in the Philippines, was kidnapped and raped. And she says, telling her story, she, she said, it was in my deepest pain, trying moments, that I really came to know the Lord in a way I had never known before. That now I'm able to have forgiven this man who violated me completely. I, mean, I don't have anything against this man. That it was in my trying moments that I really came to. And it's always like that. And it's always like that. What am I saying here? What I'm saying here is this. We, we are to understand that there is a knowing of the Lord which comes to our fellowship with Him, contact with Him, that that thing is developed. That kind of, um, that bonding is developed. And um, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me just, uh, just say what I'm saying in, in one word. Maybe that will help us. Um, First Corinthians 8 verse 3. Let me just say it in one word. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. The knowing I'm talk- that we're talking about here, it comes through love. If any man love God, the same is known of God. That knowledge I'm talking about comes through our love for God. As a person loves the Lord, the intimacy grows so strong you begin to know God in 
certain places, not in the ordinary everyday, or, I mean, everyday circumstances of life, but in trying moments when your faith has really been challenged, where you have just thrown your hands up in the air. During those moments, as you still trust in the, in the Lord, He reveals Himself because you are in a loving relationship with Him. Then He can say, I really know the Lord. Most people who have had challenges, gone through tough times, when they are through it and those challenges come again, they say, I know the Lord. He saw me through that one. He will see me through. I no longer, I'm no longer afraid. I'm not, I, I am not afraid. Especially someone who God has seen through it with financial challenges and God has provided for them. After a while, when these challenges show up, they say, God will see us through. He's done it in the, in, in the past. He will do it again. They've known the Lord that he is not a lever over the fence. He will see them through. He will come through for them. Have you, don't you realize that people, when people are, when two people are lumped t together in a problem, they bond. They bond so well. And because they are going through a suffering together, they bond so well. And they seem to do things together in common. It's the same way. Bible says that we are crucified with Christ. Hello. We are crucified with Christ. And earlier on, Paul has told the Philippians, he said, you are not only called to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for him. Praise God. So if Christ is your focus... You will not only believe in him, you not only rejoice in him, but you also suffer with him, suffer for him on this earth. When a man will not suffer for Christ, it tells you where, he, where, he, where his love is. When a man gets bitter, when he's going through trial moments for the name of the, of, the, of the Lord, it tells you where his love is. And when people will not put all focus upon Christ. It tells you where their love is. And check it. Run it down for, to most people who do not pride and rejoice in Christ and his finished work. But pride in all that they have done. Check it. Check where their love is. You realize that their love is in material things. Not in Christ. Not in Christ. But when the person's focus and everything is upon Christ and loves Christ and is bonded to him, he will suffer. When he's going through suffering for, for Christ, he doesn't get bitter. He doesn't get bitter. No. He doesn't get bitter. Because he loves him so much. Because they, they are in it together. We've been crucified with him. We are crucified to the world. Christ said, the world will hate you because he hated me. So we are with him together, going through the challenges together. So if there is that bonding and you're going through suffering for him, would you turn around and be bitter? No, you wouldn't. Let's focus on him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's focus on him. I read this last scripture to you. Acts 21, verse 13. Then Paul answered and said, What mean ye to weep and break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord. I'm ready to die for the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So, as we go through these moments, we also, the good, the good news is that there is a resurrection for us. Amen. We go through the challenging times, we go through times of affliction and all that, but there is also resurrection for us. As he is, so will he be. Hallelujah. But as we are journeying, as we are journeying on this side of earth, 
as we're journeying on this side of earth, whilst we have the seed of resurrection in us, because the Holy Ghost is, 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 is in us, that's our assurance that surely there is a resurrection for us. As we journey through this, and we go on through and we suffer for the name of the Lord, God does not leave us alone. And finally, 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 Isaiah 40, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait or hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. We will not faint. Because he that keeps us has no sleep, no slumber. Hallelujah. Even though we go through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For his rod and his staff comforts us. He does not leave us in the valley alone. He helps us. Hallelujah. They that hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. We shall continually renew our strength even as we go through trying times for him. For as we focus on Christ, persecution shall come. Trouble shall come. All kinds of things shall come. But he is with us. And he will see us through. Amen. And amen. God bless. Shall we pray? Father, we pray in the name of Christ Jesus. That by your Holy Spirit, you will help us focus upon Christ. Deep. Our confidence in God shall be because of Christ. For that is the only surety we have. Every other foundation is sinking sand. May we focus upon Christ. And may we understand that in this work with him, that we, that we will desire to know him, even as Paul says, that I may know him. May we also have the same desire. That through our love relationship with him, we will get to know him in a deeper way. In a deeper way. That when we go through suffering for him, we will not be bitter. But we will know that it is for Christ, the one who loves us and we love him. But we know that in all these, he strengthens us. And we are never alone. For he said he will never leave us nor forsake us. He who saw Joseph through in the period of 13 years in the prison, in, in captivity where his dream never came to pass but at the end of that period he lifted his head resurrection awaits us but we know that on this side of earth God almighty your strength will never fail us may this encourage our hearts and strengthen anyone who hears. In Jesus' name, amen.